صلى الله محمد وعلى محمد Thank you so much for attending tonight's program. Before we start, let's uh, recite the Surah Fatiha uh, for our dear beloved uh, Brother Ibrahim. His father recently passed away, um, Muhammad uh, Yahya al -Saraj, Saraji. So let's do a Fatiha for him, inshallah. And recently, we uh, a grand Ayatollah in Najaf by the name of Ayatollah Sayyid uh, Hakim passed away as well. So let's do a photo on this wall as well. Inshallah, um, his father and also Sayyid Hakim are granted the Shafa'at of the Ahl al Bayt, and uh, their station is high. Um, so we'll begin the program with Quran recitation with uh, the help of our uh, brother, Rabbi Labib. Then we'll have a speech of our, uh, our guest speaker, Sheikh Hassan, which will be here for two weeks. So, inshallah, there'll be a program tomorrow night as well here. Uh, starting with Maghreb, then um, Sunday, we'll be giving a speech at IFAS, and then next week, on Thursday, um, he'll be giving a speech at al Kothar, and then Friday, next Friday and Saturday, he'll be giving a speech at Al-Bashir. So if you can take uh, benefits, uh, I would recommend you go to these programs um, so you can benefit from them. I don't want to take any more of your time, and inshallah, we'll begin with the Quran recitation for the loud salawat. Allahumma sallala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Alhamdulillah, the salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والفجر وليل العشر الشفع والوتر والليل إذا يسر هل في ذلك قسم لذي حجر ألم تر كيف فعل رب بك بعاد إرم ذات العماء التي لم يخلق مثلها في البلاد وثمود الذين جابوا الصخر بالواد وفرعون ذي الأوتاد الذين طغوا في البلاد فأكثروا فيها الفساد فصب عليهم ربك سوط عذاب إن ربك لبالمرصاب فأما الإنسان إذا نبتله ربك فأكرمه ونعمه 
وعما بعد فقال الله الحكيم في محكم كتابه أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من عمل صالحا من ذكر أو أنثى وهو مؤمن فلنحيينه حياة طيبة ولنجزينهم أجرهم بأحسن ما كانوا يعملون Whoever acts righteously whether male or female should he be faithful we shall revive them with a good life and pay them their reward by the best of what they used to do. Dear brothers and sisters, mu'mineen and mu'minat, jami'an, salamun alaykum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of your great deeds and a'mal, and inshallah accept all of your commemoration and mourning for Imam al Hussein in the month of Muharram. And inshallah, we'll ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to extend his mercy upon all of us and upon all of the Marhumin and Marhumat, especially the recent deceased one, uh, the brother from the community, and Allah's uh, Sayyid Hakim by reciting loud salawat. We also would like to express our thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this bounty and ni'mah participate in the majlis in the beautiful name of in the beautiful name of Allah Hussein and its banner and to be able to learn from the school of the thought of the Ahubates and inshallah put to practice what we learn from this school. Let's recite the third salawat. And most important of all, let's express our most Sincere and deepest of condolences to the heart of the Imam of Time, as that the Sahib al Asr al Zaman, and Jalallah Ta'ala, and the Sharif. For the murtherum of Abba Abdullah, for the murtherum of Imam al Sajjad, alayhi wa salatu wa salam, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put our name among his true companions and followers by reciting your loudest of salawats. Allah. So we started talking about this new level of life, this new level of living, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to as hayatan tayyibah. As if like, you know, while we're living in this world and we're going about the, the same daily routines that every person is doing, this second level of life is happening. So in a way it becomes, like you can say, an obligatory or, or perhaps a choice for every single one of us to be able to cringe to the next level, to cringe to the, the second level in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to as hayatan tayyibah. Meaning that if we are capable of having such a life, why would we settle for something less? If we are capable of reaching you know, the skies, if we are capable of reaching, you know, uh, as if like there are no limits when it comes to the matter of the growth and the spirituality, why do we settle down for less and for the bare minimum and try to remain with you know, whatever status or the position we have in terms of the spiritual growth? Because we know we have this one-time use capital and this one-time use capital, no matter how much of wealth, fame, power, knowledge, experience, networking, status we may have, we cannot gain a single drop more of this capital. What is that capital? That is the life that we all bless us. And again, we do not know how long or for how many more days or how many more months or years Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to extend his mercy upon us and give us this, this choice to actually be alive and be able to choose in this life. Because once the life is over, once that, you know, as Rabbi Israel comes, 
then the choices stops as well. That's why they say, even in heaven, the believers in the mean and not as they enter the heaven of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Jannah and Tajreen and Tajreen and Tajreen, as they see all of the bounties and this, this na'am, this na'amat of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they get so excited and they get so happy and they get so content that out of their rezaya, out of their contentment, they want to offer you know, two rackets of prayer as a sign of thankfulness. So even in heaven, the angels will stop them and tell them there is no more room for doing any of these good deeds. Everything that you have done was you know, the world of dunya, and now it is only the time of seeing the results. So no more actions. In a sense, every minute, every second, every day, every hour that we are going through, we should consider it as, as the most important capital that we all have. Usually you think and overthink and do like, different analysis and read about different theories and talk and have consultation with so many people, so many brothers. When it comes to the matter of investment, let's say, you know, I make this amount of money. I want to make sure that within one year, two years, three years, four years, how much more can I make from the same amount that I have today? When it comes to the matter of investing our money and wealth, we do a lot of research. And it's not like only one day, one week, or one month. We constantly keep it up to date. As if, like, if you invest on something today, we're constantly searching and seeking to find a better investment. So if you are this cautious, if you are this eager, to extend the investment that we have in terms of the material, like, you know, bounty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. Then you have to imagine how much more we have to be cautious and how much more we have to be enthusiastic about learning how to spend the one-time use capital that we all have. So the base of the argument is that we set our purpose, we set our goal and objective to reach, inshallah, this hayatan, by as, I, as we've discussed before, it is actually among the reasons, we can say a major reason, that Abu Abdullah Hussein al-Salaam made his move. He made his move to make sure that he would awaken the hearts of the people. It was not like he was after the power. It was not like he was trying to become the Khalif of the Muslims. When you look at his father, Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib al-Salaam, Maybe it's before the Battle of Sifrin, I could be wrong, but as uh, one of the companions goes to the tent of the Imam, he finds Amir al-Mu'minin in, in, in a position that he's sewing his shoe. So he tells the companion, he says, how much do you think this shoe is worth? Imagine a second-hand use, you know, second used of shoes that's been thrown out and it's putting patches on it. So he shows that shoe to the companion and says, how much do you think this is, this will work? Companion says it's probably not worth anything. Give that as a gift to anybody, they're probably going to pay you something because they will feel bad. So I mean, many times on that says, you know, you know, how much this shoe actually worth? Is it saying nothing? The entire governing over the Muslims is worth less to me than this piece of like you know second hand used blown up like you know piece of shoe. So, in a way, when we talk about the movement of Imam Hussein, the objective of power gets ruled out by itself. If it was, you know, the matter of power, Imam Hussein would have gone through the same strategies that would be common within, you know, the wars. He could have easily, like, you know, gathered a lot more people if the case was to obtain the power. And that's why a lot of people actually joined the Imam at the beginning of his move, when Imam made his move from Mecca. When he stopped his hedge, a lot of people joined, you know, the caravan of the Imam, hoping that they would get, you know, a share, a benefit of the power. They thought that Imam Hussein is going to like make an uprise, and because he's the grandson of Rasulullah, because he's so popular, you know, he's going to take over the power in the new Khalafat, in the new governing system. You know, those who have company Imam automatically will gain, you know, some part, some sort of status. They will gain some sort of the power. But when Imam al Hussein on the night of Ashura, he removes the bay'ah, that's when, like, you know, Imam is clearly telling us by his action that this movement of Imam al Hussein does not have any sense or any 
bounty of the material world. It is solely and purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is why it becomes this guiding factor for years and years and years, generations and generations and generations to come. So we see that again, when we look back in history, so many people, so many figures, so many famous people, they have like, you know, done rebellions, they have uprised, they have stood up for the matter of justice. On an everyday basis, we see so many innocent lives being taken away. So many people get oppressed. So many innocent women and children get killed all over the world. But their names, you know, does not remain like the name of Abu Abdullah Hussein, his companions, the Bani Hashim, and, you know, the tragedy of Karbala. So what's the difference? If it's standing up for justice, you know, the other people have stood up for justice as well before. It's not only a honest. If it's a matter of just, you know, making sure that you stand up against an oppressive, like a tyrant, khalif, or, or a government, or a like, you know, president of the time, so many people have done this in the past. But what makes, you know, Imam of the Saints move so unique and so alive as we speak of, it is because the entire move out of the sincerity has been done only and solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why it continues to be alive, even though after 1400 years has passed from the time, 1300 years has passed from the time, still we can see that every year more people get, you know, uh, get in contact with, with the tragedy of Karbala, they learn about the, the movement of the Muhammad of the same, and mashallah, it doesn't matter from which faith they are, the minute we explain the details of this movement, they embrace the tragedy of Karbala, and they talk about it. It, it basically opens up their horizon, it opens up their, uh, their scope of perspectives, it opens up the realities to them. As they think about this movement, they think about how Imam of the same, out of you know, true sincerity, was able to not only himself, but take along with him 72 companions and the Bani from all ages, from all races, from you know, different backgrounds, and make them all as if like everlasting role models for the humanity. So that's the beauty, that's the art in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifests through the hands of Allah Abdullah Hussain al so if we put that as our objective, that we want to go on a path in which Imam Hussein rose to show us this path. He gave up his blood, not only for himself to you know, reach the highest level of, of love and affection of Allah, but rather clear the path for us so that we can see and we can continue with the footsteps. And that's you know, what's the meaning of Shia. The Shia means the follower. The follower is someone who actually follows. And that's why they say, uh, for example, when Amir al muminin and his famous companion, Salman al-Farsi, as they were walking, you know, when they would look back, they would see only one set of footprints. Two people walking, but one set of footprints. Meaning that Salman al-Farsi was so careful, so cautious, to make sure that he followed every step of Amir al muminin to the point that if they would walk together, he would make sure that he would place his foot exactly where Amir al-Mu'minin had placed his foot before. So that's, that shows like how much, like, you know, uh, say, concern the companions of the Ahl Bay had in their time. Perhaps that is why they, they, they say, you know, the Salman and al Mahmoud, right? You know, the way that, you know, they, they, they changed their life, the, the way they followed you know, the Ahl Bay, you know, it, it is just one of a kind when it comes to the examples that we see within their life. So when we want to talk about this Hayatan Bayyuba, it has so many different aspects. It's not only, again, a single act. So I mentioned this again yesterday. Sometimes when we talk about the religious or spiritual journey, and we talk about how to elevate in terms of spirituality, we tend to think about, oh, okay, so I will do, I will do this at the time of the prayer. When I offer my Salat, I'll make sure I'll focus more on the topic of spirituality. Or when I recite the Quran. Or when I fast during the month of Ramadan, or when I come to the matches of Imam Al Hussein, the first sentence of Muharram, or inshallah, if I go to Hajj, if I go to Ziyar. These are all correct, but at the same time, you're talking about Hayat, you're not talking about only the spiritual Hayat. It is again in a general form, meaning that it, it, it covers 
our entire stages of life. So that's why we have to aim for it in every single action or thought or feeling that we have. The harmony between the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we act. So among all of this, tonight I'm going to talk about one of the famous, as we can say, bounties that we all have and we all have been blessed with. And with this bounty, we can achieve so many things. At the same time, we can lose so many things. So it's this specific bounty is a bounty that because of it, so many people actually go to the hell in the hereafter. For the sake of this bounty, so many people actually find themselves in, 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 the, in the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the sake of this same bounty, so many people may actually get diverted from the Sarat of the At the same time, if it's used properly, if it's like, you know, put into its you know, proper place, so many people have been able to gain prosperity and felicity just by practicing or taking the right uh, measurement when it comes to using this bounty. You guess what bounty I'm talking about? It is a bounty that on the average base we use it at least 20,000 times in a day. On average base. 20,000 times. What bounty do we use? Exactly. The very same thing that we use to speak tongues, our language, our words, our vocabulary, the words that we decide to speak about. When you look at the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we created the, uh, the insan and we taught him the speech, we taught him the bayan. What is the bayan used for? The bayan or speaking is used to uncover the hidden. So when we speak, as if like we're talking about, you know, about the inner aspect of ourselves, we express and we expose our thoughts, we express and expose our feelings and emotions. Now imagine if everybody was mute, you know? if everybody was mute and there was no sign language, then what kind of, what form of communication would have begun? So it is a bounty to start with. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with this bounty that we can actually express how we feel, how we thought, how we think, and how that, you know, uh, uh, we want to plan in the future. At the same time, we have to be careful about this bounty because, as I mentioned, if you're not careful about it, easily you will fall down or you know, the downhill of the punishment of the hereafter. As it is said in the famous hadith, that every day, every single day, mashallah, every single part of our body, they complain and they sort of beg, you know, it's a specific bounty that we have. They say, if you leave us, we'll be good. But if you do not leave us alone, we'll be all under your control heading down towards that destruction. Yes? So that's how it, like, important it is to actually talk about this. But once again, we, don't, we, should, we should not forget about how grateful of bounty it is. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says again, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْغَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْآرُضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ وَالْسِنَةِكُمْ وَالْوَانِكُمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ among his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the difference of your languages and colors. There are indeed signs in that for those who know. Meaning these differences that we have in our language, in our, like, you know, the words and perhaps the culture that we have, it is something that has been embedded there by default. We cannot say, oh, it's, you know, it has no purpose. But we have to find the purpose for it. We have to see how, in what terms, it what aspects we can actually put it to use in a proper manner. So Imam al-Sajjad in the Rasalat al Hukuk, he talks about the boundaries in which we should contain this bounty of tone or language or, or, uh, or the tongue that we have. He says, Three things. And the right of tongue is that you consider it too noble for obscenity, accustomed it to good, directed to politeness. So in a way, see yourself, see your level, see your status higher than a person who fall in for obscenity. At the same time, try to accustom yourself, try to make yourself used to saying good 
while you direct your tongue towards politeness. Sometimes you say a good thing, but we say it in a disrespectful manner. We may have a good intention, but when we say it, we may actually ruin the entire second intention that we have. And that happens a lot, especially during the majalis that we have. And myself, I've witnessed so many of these cases. Because usually when we have majalis after majalis, when the program becomes so uh, intense in a way, a lot of stuff has to be done. So many people come to the majalis, to the masjid, alhamdulillah, that's a good sign. At the same time, when we have too many people, too many brothers and sisters, there will be too many different set of preferences. Perhaps there will be new members to the community. Some people may not know what are the, for example, the policies of a specific center. So they may come, they may do, or they may like come for a small like mistake, unintentionally. At the same time, those who are like the elders of the community, because they, they, they know every single policy of the center by heart, when they encounter like a single mistake unintentionally, when they come, when they want to do the tazakko, when they want to like, you know, give that little like heads up to the person, they may you know, be taken overboard and they may actually be so harsh in doing so that it will actually you know, break the heart of that new member, uh, that new member of the, com the community. So again, the intention is good. You know, for, for example, that, that older man, that uncle, that the person who's been, mashallah, one of the pillars of, of the majlis, one of the pillars of the center, he wants to do something good. He wants to give like a very, let's say, slight recommendation to the person. At the same time, because it is so obvious for him, in, in a way of like you know, or conveying the message, he goes to the extreme. Maybe his voice gets like, you know, he rises his voice too much. Maybe he says it in, a, in a, like an angry mode, although he may not even like, you know, uh, realize it as he's speaking. Because again, it's something so obvious for him. So let me give you an example. Uh, one of the centers, not here, but you know, it would happen it was like, like after the English program, they would do the Salat, and after Salat, they would have, would have a different program, and at the beginning of the, the, the program, they would decide the Ziyarat of Ashura. At the same time, the stage or the circumstance was in a way that if anybody wanted to ask question or like talk, you know, there was no room in order to actually be able to speak, they had to go outside of the masjid. There was no other room, there was no hallway, you know, basically they had to leave the masjid and talk outside of the masjid. So the elders, they knew about this. But then again, in the month of Muharram, you have so many people who you know, just come to the masjid on the days of Muharram. So at least two or three times it happened that after the Salat, people were trying to ask questions and not just questions, I'm not talking about socializing, no, I'm talking about real questions. They had fatigue questions, they had fatigue questions, you know, religious questions. But because the brother wanted to recite the Ziyan of the because of the respect that he had for the Ziyan of the Bashra, which is correct, he would shout behind the microphone to say, oh, if you do not want to listen to Ziyan of the Bashra, make sure you do not come to the Majlis of See what I'm saying? The intention is good. Huh? He wants to show the respect for Ziyan of the Bashra, but the way he does it, it is through an improper manner. So what happens at the end? Allah so Imam Sajjad says, This tongue that we have, you have to make sure that we, we, we make it used to, or we, we make it practice, you know, the proper manner. If he, if he wants to speak of something, say it through the proper channel. Think about it before we say it. The fourth, you know, criterion that Imam Sajjad says, it is that to only use our tongue, use our language, use our speaking skills for two things. Number one, for dunya and akhirah and whatever it gives us the manfa'ah of the dunya and akhirah. If it doesn't have any manfa'ah, if it doesn't have any blessing for us, if it doesn't have anything for us in return, then should leave it. Just leave it for what he wants to talk about. And this is where it becomes a very broad in terms of definition. So let's review our day out of the 20,000 on average base, right? Out of the 20,000 words that we have spoken today. How many of these words were actually beneficial for us? How many of them were just, you know, lahri words or live words? The words that you know, it comes to us as a game. 
or the words that has absolutely no purpose. We're just talking to make sure the time passes by. Furthermore, take this one more step back and like, you know, further, and that's you know, the topic of social media. You know, today, a lot of people, they do not speak physically with the COVID and all of the social distancing. But how do we speak? We speak through our cell phones. We speak through our, like, you know, let's say, uh, you know, the chat, like, the cell phones are used for chatting and, and you know, the entire social media. So I'm not sure what's the average, you know, text or messages that every person you know, sends on a single day. But I'm sure if it's not less than 20,000, it should be more than 20,000. Yes, a lot of people do this. I'm assuming it's just more than 20,000 messages per day, mashallah. Very popular. So we have to do that review again. To see out of all of these messages that we send, whether we forward or we comment or we send, we, we send the part, we send the, like, you know, the thumbs up, all of this. How much of this were actually beneficial for our dunya and Afara, And how many of those were absolutely had no use for our dunya for our. And sometimes it becomes worse. A lot of stuff we say stuff that we actually not only do not provide as manfa, but rather it gives us that harm. One single word, one single like, you know, forward by mistake, one single, for example, we do not do our research and as I just received these messages online, and I just forwarded it to my circle of friends. A lot of times by just doing so without thinking, I'm just spreading rumors, I'm spreading gossips, and I'm spreading false reports, I'm spreading like, you know, false teachings of religion. And as I go through, you know, what makes the, you know, the language be corrupted, one of them is the fact of, you know, being part of a circle group or a person who changes the religion. Religion, if you want, is not that, that difficult. All you have to do is to do that false propaganda. The very same thing that was done from the early time of Islam till now. Just think about it. You know, how clever, I want to say clever, I mean shaitanic, clever, not like a, like a pious clever, was Muabia and, and his like, you know, governing system that the people of Sham, when they heard that you know, Amir al Mu'minin was striked on his head in the masjid, they were raising the criticism that, oh, did Ali ibn Abi Talib actually pray in his life? At that time, there was no social media. The only means of message was writing letters or people traveling from you know, one side of the world to the other. But within the 20 years, 20 years plus, that Muawiyah had the power, because he actually gained the power of, of Damascus from the time of the second caliph. So from time of the second caliph all the way to the time of the miracle of the of the capital of the years, 25 or, or give or take like, a few years, he was able to do or work so hard and so like, you know, perhaps you can say detail in the minds of people that they, they were absolutely in a stage of ignorance about, you know, the, perhaps what we say, the most true and the only one, the unique companion of was one. So if he was capable to do that, 1300 years ago, with, without any technology, without any means of like you know, messaging, social media, advertising, all of this stuff. So you can see how much of a threat would that be living in our time. Because we're constantly dealing with so many, so many amounts of information coming to us from different sources. And at the, time, at the same time, we do not have enough time to have a good research on everything that we have seen. That shows that we all what such a mess we may be with, and how careful and cautious we must be when it comes to the matter of, you know, this messaging or the social media and all of the applications that are out there. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not saying not to use them. No, use them. But you have to learn how to use them before we actually use them. And by the spread and by the pandemic of COVID, most of us, we got forced to, you know, get trained in a way to use them as a primary source of communication. Everything became virtual, the majalis became virtual, the, the circle of the, the friends became virtual, the communities became virtual, everything became virtual. In a sense, everybody got a taste of how easy it is to just send a message instead of, for example, getting the getting my car, driving all the way to Al Mahdi, making sure I'm there on time and wait for the shade to finish the speech and wait for the, the Latina to finish. And inshallah, at the time of dinner, I would get a chance to say hello and salam to you other brothers and sisters. So I just stay home and I just send a message and I forward it to everybody that I know. 
So if you have tasted the, the, the easiness of it, if you have tasted like you know how easy it is you know to continue or, or to keep up our, our relations with uh, everybody within our social like you know, network. At the same time, you have to consider like you know what are the threats that we're dealing with when it comes to the matter of using. So you have to be smart about it. You have to think about it, and of course, when it comes to the matter of uh, the messages that we gain, we always have to have this in mind. First thing you have to see whether it's beneficial for our dunya or whether it's beneficial for our akhira. If that's the case, then I'll look over. It. If that's not the case, immediately put it to the sun. And that's something you have to do on a daily basis. And so do not use the tongue except in situation of needs and benefits of the religion and this world and in this world and refrain from any meddling in which there is little to be gained and there is no security from its harm that accompanies its small benefits. So have this like you know, analysis, have these kinds of pros for every single message that we receive. Correct? Now, then Imam continues and says, Why you add the Shahid and Ab, what the Lilo Alai, what is I, you know, Abel, the Akhlehi, what Hosno Sirati, and the Sane, and all of that I love the law of Aliel, Adin. It is the witness to and the evidence of the existence of the intellect. The, the, the demonstration of an intelligent person's intellect is through his reputation of good speech. And there is no power but in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the high and the great. So we want to talk about, you know, this bounty, this ni'ma of language, words, and tongue, the way we speak. There are so many ahadith that tell us to be aware of this bounty. At the same time, so many ahadith that they give us this, this green light to go ahead and take advantage of this bounty, but in a proper manner. If I want to give an example of both sides, a corrupted tone or a corrupted language and the virtuous language, perhaps we can say something that has been followed the path of the Ahadith. We can make a comparison between how Yazid speaks and how, for example, David Zainab gives a sermon in the very same Majlis. So if you know, if you do not know Yazid, he was actually a poet in terms of literature. He was very, like, you know, expert in the sense that he would give the he would say poetry right on the spot. But there are so many poetry that has been recorded in the history from the Malaun Yazid. One of them is when, when the caravan of the Bayt actually came brought and they enter the God of Mara and they get placed in front of the Yazid. They bring the, the beautiful head of above the line, the same thing. On that stage, he starts to give this poem. He says, Light Ashiyahi, the Badr and Shahidu, Jazal, Jazal Hazraj in Wahil Asal. I wish that my elders, my ancestors of my tribe, would have been present here. As if like that, they could see how much of the swords and the spears I have drawn from the time of the Khazraj, within the tribe of Khazraj. Ya hillu wa stahillu faraha from naqalu ya yasidu la khushan. If they see what I have done, they will become so excited, they will become so happy that they would say, O oh, Yazid, may Allah give you more bounty. Continue what you're doing. At Hatal Then if they would they would be here, they would say that you know, all of the stuff, all of the people that you have killed are a replacement of those who were killed in the battle of Badr. Then this is where he actually he expresses his faith, he expresses his religion. This is the Bani Hashim. They were just playing around with the Khilafah. And there is no such a thing as a news or revelation or religion. All of them were just like, like made up information. So immediately when he says that, then who stands up? Immediately right there in front of everybody, 
Roman face the they face the prisoners right in, in the middle of the Dar al Imara. And Yazid had already invited, you know, most of the elite members of you know, the Sham. Not only that, he had invited a lot of people from the neighboring countries to just express his victory over the grandson of Rasulullah. So all the eyes are watching his prisoners, and Yazid is, is just blasting about his victory. Immediately when he says this, Lady Zainab stands up. And she starts by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Sallallahu ala rasulih, wa alihi ajma'in. The very first thing she does, praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, recites you know, her, her blessing and her peace upon Rasulullah and, and his progeny. Then she continues and says, Sadaqallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yaqul, thumma kana aqibat al-ladina asa'u su'u in tadlabu bi ayat Allah, wa kanu biha, then the fate of those who committed misdeeds was that they denied the signs of Allah and they used to derive them. Immediately there, she hits basically the mouth of Yazid Very beautiful sermon. You can find, you know, the Arabic, the Farsi, and English in mind. And I think they good because it's a little bit lengthy. But highly recommend you know, to go and go over the different aspects that she actually talks about and how she constantly attacks you know this ideology that Yazid is trying to preach and how she destroys basically every single dream that this Yazid has from conducting you know this act against the grandson of Rasulullah to the point that you know she actually says this out in open it says, she says, وَلَا إِنْ جَرَّتْ عَلَيَّ الدَّوَاهِ مُخَاتَبَتَكْ إِنِّي لَأَسْتَسْغِرُ She says, even though you have caused so many pains, you have caused so many difficulties, you have oppressed us in so many different ways, إِنِّي لَأَسْتَسْغِرُ I see you as nothing. I see you as the lowest of all. I see you as if like you do not exist. At the same time, even though you are so little in terms of your existence, you've been able to cause so much of pains and oppression, making a, a very interesting equation here of how little a person may be in terms of a true existence. You know, we talk about hayat and tawida. And that little of, of, of having this you know, existence leads to creating of so much of calamities and, and pains and sufferings and like, um, oppression for others and how high are your criticisms upon everybody else in a way she draws the line for this really all of your you know as what you see on parameters like power people and then there's an army people you're sitting there and you're reciting a poem you know against the progeny of Rasulullah at the same time when I look at you I see nothing and then she continues just wait it is only enough for us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the judge, Rasulullah is your enemy, and Gabriel or Jibra'il is the witness. Just wait and wait when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the judgment. And by the end of her speech, the entire momentum of her, you know, that, that place, that, uh, that session, that majlis, changes. Even though Yazid has spent so much money, even though it is at Yazid's home, basically, they have the advantage of being, like, being at their own place. So everything is accord it's going according to his will. Lady Zainab Salamu is capable to, just by giving a very simple excellent, to change the entire situation in the favor of enlightening the people who were present. And again, the people who had absolutely no idea about the They had absolutely no idea about the topic of the moment. They do not need to talk about the mama, even me. That's like a theological you know, discussion that I'm going to have. But a lot of people, they do not understand the topic of Imam at that time. They just thought of Imam Hussein as someone who was pious, who was learned, and he had an opinion of his own, just like other companions of Rasulullah. So absolutely no sense of like you know, having fans or people who were learned or who could actually follow the, 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 the words of Lady Zainab Salamullah But then again, that blood of Ada, that blood of Amir al in her, reached the position that it changed the entire atmosphere and changed the entire momentum 
in favor of the actor. So if you want to talk about it in brief, what corrupts the, the tongue or the language, number one, talking, and number two, over talking, number three, bad talks, number four, arguing, number five, verbal abuses, number six, excessive eloquence, number seven, swearing, number eight, cursing. This was what I was actually talking about. When we talk about those who actually change the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so the topic of cursing is haram, except for seven cases. One of those seven cases are those who change the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And according to this Rabbiya from Rasulullah, these seven groups of people will be cursed by Allah and by the Anbiya, by the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one, al muhayyiru the Kitab of Allah. The one who changes the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who alters it, the one who tries to include a teaching that is not there, the one who tries to come up with the Veda, with the innovation, the one who tries to present a religion in a way that is not there. And it continues, you can you know, search the hadith online and, and read about it. Then they say, for example, joking around is another, you know, that actually will corrupt our tongue. Joking around, that's something that we do a lot. But you have to be careful about this. As we are joking around different stuff to socialize, are we just you know doing this lahi stuff again that we're constantly like you know, trying to make jokes in order to have fun? At the same time, we're spending everything that we have or everything we have gained from you know attending you know, the majlis of Imam Hussein, or from offering the prayers on time, or from reciting the Quran or from passing the entire So by a simple joke, as if like you're sending that fire to everything that we have. Goes up. Joking by itself is not haram, but the joking that it's within the boundaries. Rasulullah used to joke, and we don't know, he used to joke, and Allah has some mushtaba about the Allah has said, actually one of the reasons that during the Sabifa, people were saying that they were criticizing Amir al-Mu'mini was the fact that they would say Amir al-Mu'mini and Yudna Abu Talib jokes a lot. He's constantly joking. We all have heard of the story when they were eating dates with Rasulullah, would leave the seats in front of Amir al After some time, Rasulullah raised you know, the question, oh, let's see who has eaten more of the dates that's around the seats. So Amir al immediately replied that, oh, let's see who has even eaten the dates with the seats. So they looked around in front of all the Prophet, there was no seats. Yeah. So they would joke around with each other. But the joking that was like within the boundaries of it, that becomes a beauty, that becomes the art of joking. Be able to say a joke that is not racist, that is not dealing with the loss, that is not dealing with like you know, all of the sinful acts, that is not dealing with making fun of people. That becomes the art of saying or telling the jokes. Fake promises, false swearing, and uh, false statements or gossiping, and so on and so forth, they have counted up to 20 different ways or acts in which one person's tongue may become corrupt. Inshallah, we can benefit from this majlis and try to focus on our language a little bit more. So what's a practical way? They say that the, one of the best practical ways is to consider how much of the damage can this tongue actually do to us. And how much of a danger we may be if we just leave it alone, if we leave it free. Again, says, it says that the language that we have, few of it, it works like a medicine, but a lot of it, it works like a poison. We always have to try to refrain ourselves from just speaking whatever that comes. From. Just that slide of the second, just that perhaps one second or two seconds, the words that I'm about to say, the statement that I want to say, is this really beneficial? Or not? Sometimes it happens when it comes to the matter of, you know, a scientific discussion, or when we have you know, questions, a lot of times we go so like you know we get like you know, observed so much by the questions that we have that we do not realize that we are asking the questions that will not have any benefits for us. We are asking these very rare cases that will never happen in our life at least, but at the same time we want to know the answer. Versus you know we know so many things that we do not put to practice. So learning about the new stuff is good, it's not bad, but they say that the question has to be a true question. 
they cannot just be because I start to think about it, I start to come up with a new set of questions. At the same time, I have to find an application for it, make sure that I put it into practice. Otherwise, the more we learn, the less we practice, the farther away we get from Allah, subhanahu I think I spoke too much. Let's finish up with the phrase of the Akhmail, in which we say, عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقي وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأهل للزيارة السلام على الحسن على Let's take a couple of minutes. Let's talk about one person who had was very dear to Abdullah Hussein, and in a way is closely related to the topic that we had a discussion about. On the day of Ashura, when the companions were all gone and were murdered, he came to the turn to the Bani Hashim. The very first one to think of Imam Hussein was his beloved son, Ali and al -Akbar. Now, it is interesting in the Naqatib how Imam says farewell, how Imam gives permission, and how the Imam actually introduces Ali and al akbar to the enemy. As if like he's giving the love of his life on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who are fathers, those who have children, they know how hard and difficult it is to see your own youth be killed in front of your eyes. And especially when this act of killing is happening to an act of ambition. So he comes up to Abu Abdullah Hussein, he asks for permission. Imam Hussein immediately gives him the permission to go to the battlefield. As he enters the battle, Imam al-Hussein walks behind him while he's holding on to his beard and he's looking at Ali and al akbar and he's saying, Allahumma shan, O Allah, bear witness that I am sending the one that has the most amount of resemblance to your holy prophet, Rasulullah, in terms of the language in terms of the logic and in terms of the appearance. Every time they would miss Rasulullah, they would look at Ali and Every time they would miss the smile of Rasulullah, they would look at Ali and al Akbar's smile. Every time the women and children would miss Rasulullah, they would ask Ali and al Akbar to come and just walk in front of us. And that is why perhaps Abu Abdullah the same told Ali and al Akbar to make sure you go and you do a last farewell to the Fiyam and to the women and children before you go to the battle. So as if they want to see one last farewell to Holy Rasulullah, as if they want to say one last farewell to the beautiful smile of Rasulullah, the beautiful appearance and, and, and the akhlaq and the mantid of Rasulullah. He goes to the battle, he fights well, he not only has the look of Rasulullah, he has the blood of Amir al muminin He killed so many that to the reports they say up to 120 people. But all of a sudden they say, Imam al Hussein, as he's watching over him, he sees that he, he, he brings his horse back and he heads towards Abu Abdullah al Hussein. So, in a way, it is the second farewell for Imam al Hussein. Some of the ones who are passionate about this, they say this second farewell was an excuse for Ali and al Akbar and for Imam al Hussein to once again embrace each other, see each other eye to eye, father to son and son to father, and say one last farewell. 
Because Ali and Al-Akbar knew that Imam Hussein does not have any water. Why did he come back and why did he ask for a single drop of water? So those who are passionate about this, they say the first time Abu Abdullah Hussein said his farewell, he could not completely detach himself from his beloved son. But the second time as he comes back and says, Oh Father, the thirst is killing me. The weight of my armor is killing me. Do we have any single drop of water that I can benefit from? from? And I can show this hypocrite what kind of a power I have. Abu Abdullah was saying, how hard would it be for the Imam that is known for his generosity, for the Imam that is known for his karamat, for the Imam when Ali and Al-Akbar was younger at the Masjid al-Nabi and Ali al-Akbar asked Imam for some grape when the season was not the season for the grapes, Abu Abdullah Hussein tapped on one of the pillars of Masjid al-Nabi and made some grapes by, by, by miraculous work and handed to Ali and al-Akbar. He is his beloved son. Now he has come back and he's asking, oh father, do you have any single drop of water? Can you use your miraculous ways? Can you use your marjizah? Can you give me some water so I can go back and fight well? Abu Abdullah Hussein looks at him and he says, oh my son, you know that I am more even thirsty than you are. Look at my lips, look at my mouth, look at my tongue, see how dry it is. This time there is no magical way. This time there is no miraculous way. This time there is no water. Go back, my son, go back and fight. Soon you will quench your thirst with Rasulullah. He's waiting for you. He has this fresh water for you. But make sure when you go there, you send my salam and tell them that I will be joining soon. Keep some of that water for me as well. Ali and Al-Akbar goes back for the second time. He fights well again, but this time they surround him from every angle possible. And they start to attack him from left and right, all at the same time until one hits him on the side. As he leans over, another one hits him on the head. So he falls down. They say he falls down on a horse in a way that the blood of Ali and Al-Akbar covered the eyes of the horse. Some say, no, the horse immediately started to run, but because he was facing the enemies, he started to go on the wrong side. He went towards the enemies and it went deeper inside the heart of the enemies. So now Imam al Hussein is looking from, from the behind, probably from Tal Zainabiya, and he sees that the swords are getting to the sky. They're rising up the swords and they're bringing down on the body that has the most resemblance to Rasulullah, on the body that looks the, the, the most similar to Rasulullah. And they cut him urban urba. They cut him to pieces and pieces and pieces until Ali and Al Akbar shouts out, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Abba Abdullah. Oh, Father, this is my last salam to you. This is my goodbye to you. They say Abu Abdullah Hussein immediately charged against the enemy. Once he pushed them back, it was already too late. So he dropped himself down from the horse. When he dropped himself down from the horse, he got onto his knees. He did not have the power to stand up. So he started dragging himself on the plains of Karbala on his knees and getting closer to Ali and Al-Akbar. When he got close to him, he leaned down. He could not pick up the body because of the condition of the body. So he leaned down. He placed the right cheek of his next to the right cheek of Ali and Al-Akbar. Then he did not come back up again. The enemy is looking at this. They start to do in Harbala. They thought Imam al Hussein has passed away. Lady Zainab, alayha, the true supporter of Abu Abdullah, she's witnessing this. She runs over the Qatla Gulf, but Abu Abdullah, Ya Allah. اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك نبينا العظيم العز الجل الأكرم الله الحق محمد وعلي وصحبه والحسن والحسين وتسعة المعصومين من قبيلة الحسن يا الله يا الله يا الله اللهم عجل له الفرج والعافية والناس وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا واشف امراضنا وارحم امواتنا واجعل عاقبه الامور خيرا 
Oh Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah, hasten, hasten, hasten the appearance of the man of time and put our name among his true companions. O oh Allah, have mercy upon us and have rahmah upon all of the Muslims. O oh Allah, give complete shafa and cure to all of those who have come down with sicknesses. O oh Allah, remove the pandemic of COVID from around the world. O oh Allah, answer the request and hajat of Muhammad and Muhammad from all over the world. O oh Allah, protect our future generations and offsprings. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, O oh Allah, give us the tawfiq of the ziyarat of the Akhir Bayt in this world and the shafa in this world and the next. O oh Allah, accept this majalis from us by your mercy and extend the rewards of this majalis to the souls of the beloved past ones and deceased ones and to the ulama and marajah. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, O oh Allah, give us the tawfiq to continue in the sarat and mustaqeen in the very last seconds of our lives and do not leave us by ourselves even for the slightest of seconds. Oh, <laughs> 
من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليك يا رب الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا ابن امير المؤمنين وابن سيد المرشدين السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة سيدة نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا فاطمة وابن فاطمة وابن وزر الموت السلام عليك وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بأمائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقي وبقي الليل والنهار يا أبا وعبد الله لقد عظمت الرزيا وجلا وعظمت المشيبة بك علينا وعلى جميع أهل الإسلام وجلا وعظمت مصيبتك في السماوات على جميع أحل السماوات ولعن اللهم متى أسسا أساس الظلم والجهر عليكم أهل البيت ولعن اللهم متى دفعتكم عن مقامكم وأزالتكم أراضكم التي رتبكم الله فيها ولعن الله أمة قتلتكم ولعن الله الممهدين لهم بالتمكين من بطانكم بريتوا إلى الله وإليكم منهم ومن أشياعهم وأتباعهم وأوليائهم يا أبا عبد الله إني سلمان لمن صالمكم وحرب لمن حاربكم على يوم اليوم ولعن الله على زيادة وعلى مهران ولعن الله بني أمية غاطبا ولعن الله ابن مرضانا ولعن الله عمر ابن سعد ولعن الله شمرا ولعن الله أمة أسرجات وألجنا وتنظبت ندى طالب بأبي أنت وأمي لقد أضم مصابي بك فأسأل الله الذي أكرم مغامك وأكرمني بك يرضغني طلب ثارك مع إمام منصور من أهل بيت محمد صلى الله عليه وآله اللهم اجعلني عندك وجيها بالحسين عليه السلام في الدنيا والآخرة يا أبا عبد الله إني أتغرب أم الله وإلى رسوله وإلى أمير المؤمنين 
وإلى فاطمة وإلى الحسن وإليك بمغالاتك وبالبراءة ممن قاتلك ونصب لك الحام وبالبراءة ممن أسس أساس الظلم والجود عليكم وأبرع إلى الله وإلى رسوله ممن أسس أساس ظلمه وبنى عليه بنيانه وجرى في ظلمه وجوره عليكم وعلى أشياعكم برئت إلى الله وإليكم منهم وأتقرب إلى الله ثم إليكم بموالاتكم وموالات وليكم وبالبراءة من أعدائكم والناصبين لكم الحق وبالبراءة من عشيائهم وأطبائهم إني سلم لمن سالمكم وحرب لمن حاربكم وولي لمن ولاكم وعدو لمن عداكم أنصر الله الذي أكرمني بمعرفتكم ومعرفة أوليائكم ورزغني البراءة من أعضائكم ليجعلني معكم في الدنيا والآخرة وأن يثبت لي عندكم قدم صدق في الدنيا والآخرة واسأله أن يبلغن المقام المهموم لكم عند الله وأن يرزغني طلب قريكم مع إمام هدى ظاهر ناطق بالحق منكم ومن أشياءه وأسأل الله بحقكم وبالشعن الذي لكم عنده أن يعطيني بمصابي بكم أفضل ما يعطي مصابا بمصيبة مصيبة أما أعظمها وأعظم رزيتها في الإسلام وفي جميع السماوات والأرض اللهم اجعلني في مضامي هذا ممن تناله من صلوات ورحمة ومغفرة اللهم اجعل محياي محيا محمد وآل محمد ومماتي ممات محمد وآل محمد اللهم إن هذا يوم تبركت به بنو أمية وابن آكلة الأكبار اللعين ابن اللعين على لسانك ولسان نبيك صلى الله عليه وآله في كل موطن وموظف وقف فيه نبي صلى الله عليه وآله اللهم لعن أبا سفيان ومعاوية ويزيد ابن معاوية عليهم منك اللعنة أبد الآبدين وهذا يوم فرح به آل زيادة وآل مروان بقتلهم الحسين صلوات الله عليه 
اللهم فبارك عليهم اللعن منك والعذاب العليم اللهم إني أتقرب إليك في هذا اليوم وفي موت في هذا وأيام حياتي وبالبراءة منهم واللعنة عليهم وبالموالاة لنبيك وعال نبيك عليه وعليه الصلاة اللهم الآن أول ظالم ذلم حق محمد وآل محمد وآخر طاب له على ظالم اللهم العن العصابة التي جاهدت الحسين وشايعت وضايعت وتابعت على قتل اللهم لعنهم جميعا السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي خلت دفنها عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بغيت وبغي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العبد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسن وأنا أصحاب الحسن اللهم خش أنت أول ظالم باللعن مني وابدأ بفي أولا ثم الثاني والثالث والرابع اللهم لأن يزيد خامصا والعن عبيد الله ابن زيار وابن مرجانا عمر بن سعد وشمرا وآل أبي سفيان وآل زياد وآل مروان إلى يوم القيامة اللهم لك الحمد حمد الشاكرين لك على مصابهم الحمد لله على عظيم رزيتي اللهم ارزقني شفاعة الحسين يوم الورود وثبتني قدم صدق عندك مع الحسين وأصحاب الحسين الذين بدلهم حجوم دون الحسين عليه السلام As you say, so you think that I can be present for all the money. I will pray that I'm going to say that.